Hello and welcome to GameSack. It's time to take a look at some more 2D games for modern consoles. You know what? 2D games are never going to die. Just evidenced by how many 2D games there are these days. It's not like they don't sell. I mean, they certainly don't sell as much as something like God of War or whatnot, but, you know, I'm fine with that. Anyway, I've got 12 games to show you today, so let's just get right into it. We start out with Blazing Chrome from Joy Masher, which is available for the PC, PlayStation 4, Switch, and Xbox One. I'm playing the PS4 version. This is a side-scrolling run-and-gun, which of course gets a lot of inspiration from Contra. When you first start out, you can choose from two different characters, but you can unlock more. In this game, it's one hit and you're dead. The controls are pretty basic. You can shoot, jump, lock your movement with R1 while you aim, and roll. You can collect a few different weapons as well as other types of power-ups. For example, you may get a shield which will let you take a few extra hits. Or this one which will make you faster and also let you double jump which is really fun to do. I hate losing this power-up because it's just so fun when you have it. Unfortunately, the weapons themselves aren't all that great. There are four of them and honestly I like the basic default one the best. Like most run and gun games, you feel like you just want to hold down the button to rapid fire, but this game doesn't really want you to do that, at least with two of the weapons. One of them is so slow that I'll avoid picking it up if I can. Fortunately, you can always switch back to the default weapon with the tap of a button. Other than that, the controls are good and it's rather fun. Especially the boss fights as they're all multi-jointed and super cool. As you can see, this game goes for the retro pixel look. The colors are heavily inspired by Contra Hardcore on the Genesis. However, there's plenty of scaling and rotating segments all over the place that could only be done with the 32-bit hardware to add a little pizzazz. Speaking of pizzazz, this Space Harrier style segment in Mission 4 is pretty cool looking. The music is mostly good, at least as far as the arrangement goes. Unfortunately, it's completely in mono and very limited in its dynamics, so it doesn't really do much to get me pumped as I'm playing. Plenty of Genesis games have a better dynamic range than this, and of course those games are in stereo as well. Not sure what happened here. Still, this is a fun one that offers quite a bit of challenge and it's worth trying out. This is Ori and the Will of the Wisps. It's available for the Xbox family of consoles, the Switch, and PC. Sorry PlayStation fans, but you can go straight to hell. I'm playing it on the Xbox Series X here. This is the sequel to Ori and the Blind Forest, which itself was an excellent game. Like that one, this is a Metroidvania. If you like Simon Belmont and or Samus Aran, this is the game for you, even though neither of them are in here, but whatever. I love the interactive storytelling that's at the beginning of the Ori games. You play through a small series of events to set things up before you inevitably get lost somewhere like the fool you are. As you wander around, you'll gain abilities like attacking and double jumping, both of which show up fairly soon in the game. There are many other special abilities like sticking to the wall, but sadly you can only equip three of these special abilities at once. There's no leveling up, but you'll gain more life and whatnot throughout your adventure. You'll also unlock new areas, and figuring out how to get to these new areas is half the fun. Well, maybe a quarter of the fun, because it can be a bit more confusing than most Metroidvanias. The map doesn't make it very clear where you can go, or where you have or have not been, especially if you purchase a map from someone. Still, you have incredible control over Ori as you go back and forth a dozen times before you figure things out. The graphics here are phenomenal, with many layers of detail everywhere. I think there could be a lot more variety, however, as no area seems to have its own signature look like other Metroidvanias. At least as far as I've played, I can't figure out where I need to go next. Still, the level of detail and color is outstanding. The music and sound are both great as well and really complement the game. I prefer playing it on the Xbox Series X. Here, you not only get HDR colors which really pop and 4K resolution, but 120 frames per second as well. I'll be honest, the 120 frames per second doesn't make a huge difference, but it's there. The Xbox version also features Dolby Atmos sound. You wouldn't think that a 2D game like this would make use of surround sound, much less height speakers, but it's actually quite effective. It's probably one of the better examples of Dolby Atmos in video games so far. 
Unfortunately, the sound will be slightly out of sync if you enable Dolby Atmos on your Xbox. This is something that Microsoft either can't fix or won't fix with their silly little console. Note that I'm not playing a Dolby Atmos as I capture this video, as no capture card can deal with that, at least that I know of. Overall, Ori and the Will of the Wisps is mostly a great time and a testament of what can be done with modern 2D games. I just wish there were more variety in the visuals, as well as better and more comprehensive map design. I'm a big Wonder Boy fan, so after the remake of Wonder Boy The Dragon's Trap, I decided to get this next game because it was super cheap. Turns out, sometimes you do get what you pay for. This is Wonder Boy Returns from CFK for the PlayStation 4, PC, and Switch. It's also available as Wonder Boy Returns Remix, which adds a few minor things. At first, this appears to be a remake of the very first Wonder Boy game, which many of you might recognize as Adventure Island. At least for the first four levels anyway, and then it mixes things up a bit. You run, jump, hold the square button to run faster, and jump higher. You break eggs for weapons. You have a timer that's always decreasing, and you need to grab food to replenish it. Fortunately, the food is all over the place. I've seen some people insist that this is a life bar. This is not a life bar in any sense, as it's one hit and you die no matter how full the bar is. At the end of the fourth level in each stage is a boss. The bosses have a life bar, which is nice, and these bosses are completely different from the original game. The skateboard item is here, but you rarely see it, though it is fun while it lasts. The graphics go for that Flash game look, or maybe a mobile game. I mean, is there really a difference? The music is a mixed bag, with most of the tunes being okay, but a couple of them being pretty good. Overall, the game plays alright, and it's a decently good time. The remix version of the game has slightly tweaked controls and an additional area. Here's R-Type Dimensions EX from IRAM, and it's available for the PlayStation 4, Nintendo Switch, iOS, and PC. It's also available for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, where it's just known as R-Type Dimensions, no EX. Screw those platforms anyway, they're not worthy of those letters. This one contains arcade versions of R-Type 1 and 2. However, here you can play them in widescreen for the first time, so that's cool. You can also enable 3D polygon graphics with the tap of the triangle button. This not only changes the graphics, but the music as well. You can do this at any time, as the new stuff directly overlays the original 2D art. This forces the 3D mode to play exactly like the original game, which is a good thing. R-Type has always been great, with absolutely fantastic weapons, each with their own advantages and all of them are super fun to use. No bad or boring weapons here. The stage design is also second to none, especially in the first game. You'll die a lot, but you always want to try again, even though you get set back because you keep learning the stage. This is one of those tough games that never really pisses me off. Somehow, the game design is just that good, and that's a very rare thing indeed. R-Type 2, which saw some of its stages used in Super R-Type on the Super Nintendo, isn't as good, but it's still fun and I'm glad it's here. Both games offer an infinite mode where you have unlimited lives and respawn right where you die. This certainly isn't anywhere near as fun, but it helps me get more footage from the game faster to show you. And as an editor, I like having a variety of footage, so, you know, gotta do what you gotta do. The new 3D graphics are pretty basic with a very low polygon count. I guarantee that most of you will think these are ugly, and, well, I certainly can't say you're wrong. I still like switching to them, though, just to see how they reimagined any given scene. You can also enable the crazy 3D mode, where it turns at an angle when you engage the polygon mode. I'm not sure what use this is, but here you go. The music also gets rearranged, and for the most part, it sounds pretty good.
comparatively, the original arcade music is very shrill and it has extremely low sound quality. This game isn't for everyone, but I certainly recommend it if you like R-Type. This is Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection from Capcom for the Switch, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC. I'm playing on the Switch here. I've been hesitant to review this one for a while because I was afraid that I'd absolutely eviscerate it. I know some of you can't stand it when my opinions differ from your own because you respond very insultingly. They're just video games people and not talking about your mom. Oh well, the cool viewers want to know my take, so this review is for them. The first thing I want to put out there is that a lot of people think that I'm a big fan of this franchise. Well, I really do like the games that are called Ghouls and Ghosts. All of the ones that are called Ghosts and Goblins I never really got into. I don't know what it is, but the ones that are called Ghouls and Ghosts just seem to be designed better. Sadly, only two games fall under that banner. This one actually tries to take aspects from both Ghosts and Goblins and Ghouls and Ghosts. Right at the start, you can select from two different stages. One of them is like a remake of the first stage from Ghost and Goblins. The other is like a remake of the first stage from Ghouls and Ghosts. This continues for level two, with the top stage being more like level two from Ghosts and Goblins and the bottom being like, well, you get the idea. Many stages fall right in the middle, with aspects from both styles represented in a single stage. The stage design has some really good ideas here and there. Like this part when you're trapped in what looks like a giant mouth that's constantly moving in and out and you've got to avoid the spikes as the screen scrolls. Or how about this part where you're riding on the backs of these eels or dragons or whatever the hell they're supposed to be. My main issue is that these parts can be pretty long and it can become rather tiresome. Seriously, this eel or dragon part feels like it takes forever. I mean, come on, man, I've got stuff to do. I've got a life. Like previous games in the series, the stages are broken up into two more or less unique areas each. Sometimes it feels like even more in this game. The boss fights can be enjoyable, but yeah, have fun trying not to get your ass kicked six ways from Sunday. Fortunately, you have unlimited lives. Another thing that you should know is that this game was done by the creator of the original Ghosts and Goblins, Tokuro Fujiwara. This game seems almost masturbatory for him as he just took it and went absolutely crazy. This game is balls to the wall difficult, and not in a way that makes you want to keep trying for very long. To compensate for this, you can take quite a bit of damage before you completely lose your armor unless you crank the difficulty up. There are also tons of checkpoints. Supposedly, on the easiest difficulty, you can even respawn right where you died, but I haven't tried that. There's also a skill tree, because of course there is. The control is good, but it's not fantastic. It feels like there's a tiny bit of lag, and I'm playing with a Switch Pro controller directly wired to the console. There's no double jump here like there was in Super Ghouls and Ghosts, but you can shoot in all four directions from the start, just like you could in one of the mill Ghouls and Ghosts. Diagonals also don't work, just like the arcade versions. That means if you press a diagonal, you'll come to a dead stop. I do wish there was a diagonals option for this, just like the Genesis version, as that might make the control feel a hair smoother. The game itself can feel a tad slow. Arthur's running animation makes it look as if he should be moving much faster than he actually is. I don't understand this, in Ghouls and Ghosts he moves around pretty quick. I have mixed feelings about the graphics. On one hand, I think they look absolutely incredible with a cool storybook feel. On the other hand, it feels kind of off for a game in the franchise, but at least it doesn't look too much like a Flash or mobile game, which is hard to do these days. The characters all look a bit silly, but still, overall I think the graphics are very well done. On the audio side, both the music and the sound are all very good and serve the game quite well. Playing this game again today, I like it more than I did in the past. However, I still don't have a strong desire to play it again. I can, however, play the Ghouls and Ghosts games endlessly, and they never get old.
I remember that this next game got quite a bit of hate when it came out, but to me it's quite enjoyable. I think it might be that fans of the original don't approve. Here's Secret of Mana for the PlayStation 4 from Square Enix. It's also available for the Vita and the PC. I go back and forth pronouncing it as mana or mana, but I usually say mana and so does the game. This is, of course, a remake of Secret of Mana on the Super NES, which was the second game in the Seiken Densetsu series. I got it as a Christmas gift one year, but for whatever reason, I never got much into it. I can't explain why. Anyway, you play as this dude. He pulls a sword which makes monsters attack, and that gets you banned from your village. I mean, come on, can you even call these things monsters? They're so cute. That village must be full of a bunch of pussies. Your attack works similar to the legendary axe on the TurboGrafx-16 or Valis 3 on the same platform. After you attack, a percentage starts counting up from 0 to 100, with 100% resulting in your strongest attack. The percentage meter lies though, as if it's at 50%, your attack seems a lot weaker than 50% of its maximum power. Also, and this is just me by the way, but I prefer a moving bar like in the legendary axe in Valis 3 rather than a counting number. Either way, or even either way, this makes the action pretty slow as you have to wait for it to be effective. Somehow much slower than Legendary Axe or Valis 3. Even with that though, it's still a very good game. The graphics use polygons for their visuals with mixed results. They try to keep the anime flavor with the 3D models and it mostly works. The cutscenes now go down to ground level with the camera moving around in 3D space. Sadly, whenever there's spoken dialogue, the character mouths don't move at all and it looks very bad. But I did hear Grandma say she saw something shiny by the falls when she was little. I just turned the voices all the way down, which is all you can really do, but the cutscenes still take the same amount of time as if the voices were playing, which technically they still are. The music is also rearranged. The original game had a few fantastic standout tunes, with the rest being not bad. The arrangement here is mostly okay, but some of those great tunes sound less good here. You can switch to the Super Nintendo version of the soundtrack at almost any time if you prefer. This remake got kind of a bad rap when it was initially released back in 2018. Honestly, I don't think it's as bad as people were making it out to be, but then again, Secret of Mana isn't a game that's tremendously important to me, so take that with a grain of salt. Next up is Assault Suit Lanos on the PlayStation 4. It's also on PC. This side-scrolling mech game is awesome. It may look like a futuristic run and gun at first glance, but it's definitely not that. In fact, some of you might recognize this game as Target Earth on the Genesis. This is a remake of that game. Those of you who were too good to play the Genesis may recognize the style of this one as Cybernator on the Super Nintendo, which is another amazing game in that same series. I bought Target Earth when it came out, and of course it absolutely wrecked me when I first played it. But as I learned how the game worked, I started to love it. That learning process took weeks though, and I haven't played it for quite some time, and that's why I'm sucking here. This version is the same way, though it's much easier than the Genesis or Mega Drive version. You start each mission by selecting the weapons and the equipment that you'd like to bring with you, but you only have so many slots. Different weapons are good in different situations, and you can even stack your armor for better defense at the cost of some slots. You earn more gear by completing each mission. The only weapon with unlimited ammo is your basic weapon, and fortunately it's effective. I like how each mission has a different objective, and you're often doing vastly different things, which was fairly uncommon back in 1990. The visuals here look pretty decent, if a little pixely if you look close. There's a lot more zooming around of the camera all over the place compared to the Genesis game, obviously. Oddly, the font looks kind of weird, and it's somewhat difficult to read, even if you're playing the game in 4K resolution. Not that this is a native 4K game, mind you. The music consists of the same melodies, only rearranged and nearly CD quality, which, if the legends are true, the PlayStation 4 is actually capable of. That's right, technology has come a long way in 30 years. 
The voices are in Japanese, even on the North American release. There is also a classic mode which features the Genesis gameplay and difficulty. It also plays the Genesis music during this mode. There's also no fancy zooming all over the place, just you getting your ass kicked. This is a really good game, but expect to put in some time to learn it to get anywhere. This one's called Clockwork Aquario, and this is the PlayStation 4 version. It's also on the Switch, Xbox One, and PC. This was being developed as an arcade game back in 1992 by Weststone or Weestone or West One or however you say it. This is the same developer of the original Wonder Boy games. It was cancelled because by 1992, fighting games and the like were way too popular, and also this got some negative feedback from playtesters who had a chance to sample it. Not too long ago, Strictly Limited Games bought up the rights. In In and a few staff from Weststone worked together to finish this up and release it. I somehow ended up with three copies of this game. I bought the first one, and the two others were sent to me by outfits who probably wanted me to cover it. Anyway, you choose one of three characters. You hit or bounce on an enemy to stun them. From there, you can hit or bounce on them again to snuff out their life completely, or pick them up and toss them to end the existence of other enemies as well. You pick up the stunned enemies automatically, which is clunky to say the least. If there's a stunned enemy and a live one in the same part of the screen, you're gonna take a hit because you touched the live enemy. This can make fighting the bosses extremely annoying, as you need to pick up the enemies to toss at the boss, but it's hard to stun the enemies without killing them all in the process. I think it might work better if they sent out fewer enemies. You can take one hit, and if you take another without first drinking a red potion, you'll die. You collect gems, and it fills a 1-up meter by your character's HUD on the screen. Fill it up completely and yeah, that's right, you guessed it, you get an extra life. See, I knew you were smart. You can also get a temporary power-up that'll allow you to shoot some stars. The graphics are very colorful with some nice scrolling, but it can be really tough to tell what's happening in all of the chaos sometimes. And that's in single player mode, I'd bet it'd be much more confusing with multiple players. There are a few adjustments that you can make to the screen, but not many. The music isn't bad, but it's not something that'll likely get in your head either. Curiously, they did add an arranged version of the soundtrack, but there's no way to play it during the game. Maybe it has to be unlocked? The problem is that this game is so clunky and chaotic that I don't feel like playing it enough to find out. And that's what it all boils down to. For me, it's a game that I would have put a few quarters into in an arcade, but then walked away never to play it again. This one is Pocky and Rocky Reshrined on the PlayStation 4 by Natsume. It's also available on the Nintendo Switch at the expense of some dropped frames here and there. Do you remember Pocky and Rocky on the Super NES? It's a run and gun game with some cool artwork, catchy music, and fun gameplay. It also offered up some pretty hefty challenge. Well, this game is basically a complete remake of that one and boy oh boy is it awesome. This is in the same family of Natsume remakes along with Wild Guns Reloaded and the Ninja Saviors The Return of the Warriors or whatever it's called wherever you live. They couldn't seem to decide on a single name for that one. Like those two, this remake is done with excellent pixel art, a wider screen, and great music. It plays pretty much just like the original. You have a rapid fire shot button which fires whatever weapon you currently have. You can collect a few different weapons and power them up a bit as well. If you get hit, you not only lose a little bit of life, but your weapon powers down too, because F you. You also have a deflect button. Using this can stop enemy projectiles and sometimes even bounce them right back at them. This is your main defense, and you should get used to using this, though sometimes the screen can be chaotic and confusing, so you're gonna get hit, period, unless you spend unhealthy amounts of time practicing this game. You also have a special attack, of which you have a limited number. Lastly, you have a slide function. I wish this worked like an alien soldier in that you'd be invincible while doing it, but no. Sometimes you'll encounter a being who will give you a special feature if you have enough money, and what you get is random. The biggest flaw with this game is that there's no option to strafe. And man do I ever want to strafe. 
There is a power-up move that Rocky can use that allows it, but only for a limited time, of course. Also, the boss fights are a little too long for my taste, but that's just me. As always, a boss life bar would be greatly appreciated. In the single player game, you'll go back and forth playing as Pocky or Rocky in various forms. I like how that changes things up and adds a bit of variety in single player mode. The cutscenes before each stage set things up and they're less slow and boring than they were in the original game. There are unlimited continues and if you make it far enough, you don't have to start back at the very beginning of a stage. It also saves your progress, just like you'd expect from any modern game. Weirdly, you have to unlock the easy mode. As I said before, the pixel art here is excellent. There's a lot of detail and animation everywhere, and the artwork and color are all outstanding. The game defaults to being a bit stretched, and you can fix that in the options if you must, but I think it looks fine in full screen. You can also engage scan lines if you want. The music has been arranged from the Super Nintendo version, and it too is fantastic. <laughs> It's very Japanese flavored and it fits the game like a glove with excellent sound quality. I really do recommend this game as it's fun, the characters and enemies are interesting, and well, it's just worth it, man. This next one really surprised me. In fact, it might be one of my favorite indie games in this episode. I only have it digitally, but you know what? I think I might want to pick up the physical edition as well. Here's Hunt Down from Easy Trigger and Coffee Stand. It's on the Switch, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, PC, Mac, and even Linux, Android, and iOS. I've had this run and gun on my Switch for a while, but I haven't played it until now. Man, I gotta tell you, I really regret not playing this sooner because it's awesome. Basically, you're a bounty hunter and each stage has you going after a bounty. As you can imagine, the boss is the bounty. Each stage is part of a larger area dedicated to one type of gang, and you'll take out the gang leader at the end of the last stage in an area. You can get many different weapons, all of which are effective and fun to use. You even have sub-weapons that you can toss like an axe or some grenades. The control is quite good and you can take cover in certain areas or behind certain objects. Each and every enemy has a life meter, and you know what, I like that. You also have a life meter and it's easy to take hits, but you'll respawn not too far behind at the nearest Tony's surgery and repair truck. This game has a great sense of humor and it never seems to come across like they're trying too hard, at least not to me. The characters all talk a lot and you'd think it'd become annoying, but somehow it never bothered me, not even once. Dogs with and some of these bosses I had to fight many times because they're not super easy, and even then I didn't get tired of it. Need some gasoline, yeah. Hey. Hey. I'm the strongest dog of them all, yeah. The main game has a bit of story to set up each area before you go. There's also an arcade mode where you can select different characters as you try to take down the entire area at once. But be careful, because your life bar is smaller here. The graphics go for that pixel art style, and I think it works great here. The animation is good, and I love the little details that are everywhere. It reminds me of arcade games that have a similar style, like Elevator Action Returns or The Outfoxies. The music is also great most of the time. I don't get I get even. Here and there is a little bit more ambient than pumping, and of course that's fine. This one is very addictive to play, and I want to keep going. I haven't heard of anyone else talking about this game unless I've just been living under a rock, which I've got to admit that I do sometimes. If you haven't already done so, I really do recommend checking this one out. Stash collected.
This is super epic from Undercoders on the Nintendo Switch. It's also on the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC. This is another Metroidvania, but it's definitely more of a lighthearted one. You play as a raccoon riding on a llama for whatever reason. You're off to topple the Regnet Corporation, which creates free-to-play games to take over the minds and wallets of the people. The game takes place inside of their headquarters, and the enemies are mostly their employees as well as some other fiends. Everything here is basically satire. Like any Metroidvania, you run back and forth, but there's a little less backtracking in this one. The castle, so to speak, is mostly horizontally oriented. You don't level up with experience points, but you can get new weapons as well as upgrade the ones that you have. You've got three different attack buttons, each of which has a different style of weapon. You can also buy defense items for yourself and your llama. You also learn new moves like double jumping as well as special attacks. You have different meters for your special abilities. You can also buy refills and more life capacity as well. The action and control is generally pretty smooth, but a few of the enemies aren't that fun to fight, so I just avoid those particular ones. You save at the company bathrooms, and it goes through the same text each time you stop by. After the very first visit, I think a simple flush sound would suffice when saving the game. I really like the map though, especially the mini-map that's in the upper right corner of the screen. I wish Ori's map was this good, as it's clear where you haven't been and what places still need to be explored. The graphics are very simple and pixel-based. You've got some decent scrolling and a hint of a lighting effect here and there. Some spots even have transparencies. Overall, nothing amazing, but it could certainly be worse. The music isn't bad. Some of the themes can actually be pretty good, but a few of them are also pretty ho-hum. Overall, if you want to play a game that makes fun of the gaming landscape a bit, then this would be a good game to try. Here's Streets of Rage 4 by .mu for the Switch, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC, including Linux and Mac. I'm rocking the PS4 version here. This is another one I haven't reviewed, mainly because I didn't think people would handle my review well, because I didn't think it was the greatest thing ever, like everyone else seems to think it is. Hell, I hadn't even bothered to finish the game until tonight. But again, the cool people want to know what I think about this one, so here we go. I won't be digging super deep into the play mechanics or anything, just how fun the game is or isn't to me. First of all, this isn't even by Sega or Ancient. Sega couldn't even be bothered to publish it. That right there feels wrong. When it was first introduced, the game's visual style definitely caused some ruckus. It looks very western, and it doesn't remind me of the Streets of Rage series at all. That being said, you do get used to it as you play. And it plays quite well, and there's a lot of meat here. You can choose from a few characters and unlock more as you go. The variety of bad guys to beat up is also quite good, though you'll soon find the ones that you absolutely hate. Like these shield guys, they're no fun. Or these guys that keep their hands in their pockets for some reason. They're easy to beat, I just think they look stupid. Who the hell does that? One thing I do not care for is that it's very difficult to grab a health item or a star if you're holding a weapon. Come on, just grab it, it's right there! Ugh! Now, it's not impossible, but it's still quite annoying. There are quite a few people who think this game is awful and a complete black eye on the series. Well, I certainly would not go that far. The game is pretty fun, and it's a great beat-em-up. I love some of the little touches like the cops and the thugs beating each other up in the jail level. Unfortunately, they're united in their desire to beat you up. The bosses are generally pretty fun to fight as well. The game gives you more than enough chances to restore some of your life with food that you can find all over the place. The collision is generally pretty good, which can be bad for you if you let yourself get surrounded. This can happen easily in single player mode since all of the enemies are focused only on you. This can be played by up to four players simultaneously, by the way. There are some retro levels hidden around here and there. For example, to find the first one, you need to taser this arcade machine. These just feature some short pixel-based stages from older games to get through really quick, and they're not very substantial. But it's cool that there are little secrets in the game to find. Usually when playing beat-em-ups, I start feeling fatigued, and I get bored when I get to the fifth level or so. Sadly, that happens here as well, especially with some of the levels being as big as they are. The good news is that you don't need to get through all 12 levels in one go. You can pick up at the last level you started playing, but you only start with two lives. 
Still, at least you don't have to get burnt out playing this. Hell, it took me two years or however long it's been to finally beat the game, mainly because I never really felt like playing it. Once you do beat it, it's kind of a burden off of your shoulders, and now you can just screw around and have fun without the pressure. There's also the Mr. X's Nightmare DLC for 8 bucks, which includes some characters like Max here. It also has the survival mode here, which a lot of people really like. I'm not a fan of survival modes or boss rushes in general, but I like that the DLC added some new T. Lopes music to the mix. His stuff is always worth listening to. Like I said, you do get used to the graphics. They are in no way bad at all. In fact, they do an excellent job looking like a well-drawn comic book. While it doesn't look like Streets of Rage to me, it still looks great. I'd really like to see another Comic Zone game done in this exact style. Wouldn't that be awesome? The music is mostly good with a few tracks that are really good. There are a few average tracks as well that are far from spectacular. Yuzo Koshiro returns to compose half a dozen tracks or so, along with Motohiro Kawashima, who also worked on Streets of Rage 2 and 3's soundtrack. For whatever reason, either the publishers couldn't afford to have them do the entire soundtrack, or the composers didn't want to do the entire soundtrack. Or maybe the publisher didn't want them to do the entire soundtrack, which would be really, really odd, but hey, weirder things have happened. Not that the music done by the other composers here is bad or anything, but just knowing that it's not all done by the original composers makes it feel even less like a real Streets of Rage game. When it comes down to it, I don't love this game as much as some of its vocal supporters do, nor do I hate it as much as its vocal opponents. Honestly, I prefer the Turtles game, Shredder's Revenge. Still, it's an interesting game that plays well, and overall I think it's worth owning and playing. There you go, more 2D games for modern systems. I feel there were a lot of great ones in this episode, and I'm glad I finally caved and talked about Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection as well as Streets of Rage 4. So what was your favorite game in this episode, and what are some 2D games for modern consoles that maybe I haven't played yet that I should check out? Let me know, and in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Oh hey, Joe from GameSack here. Do you suffer from extreme bouts of burning diarrhea? Well, <laughs> don't we all? In fact, boiling hot diarrhea affects 192,638 out of every 192,639 people across the entire world. And it's no laughing matter. It can cause massive dehydration, which can be life-threatening. It can also make your butthole feel like someone's touched it with a hot fire poker. But what if I told you that there was a way to stop or significantly reduce bouts of blazing hot diarrhea?